three, two, one. Lift off of the Falcon 9. The SpaceX Falcon 9 is one of the most amazing feats of modern engineering. It is the first reusable orbital class rocket and has taken the launch industry by storm. I'm sure most of you are already familiar with the Falcon 9 and have seen it do amazing things like landing on a drone ship at sea. But have you ever wondered about the computers and software that would be needed to control such a complex machine? How powerful are these computers? And what kind of operating system and software does it run? Well, in this video, I'll be answering all of these questions and more. We'll be taking a look at the computers inside of a SpaceX rocket to try and figure out how it works and if it's anything like the device you're watching this video on. My name is Zach and I want to quickly thank you for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe if you'd like to see more content from me. I would really appreciate it. But first, let's look at some of the biggest challenges of designing and programming computer hardware for a rocket like the Falcon 9. Being attached to a rocket isn't the most gentle environment for electronics. Besides the obvious fact that rockets go into space, there's also a lot of violent vibrations and noise. Even inside the payload fairing, noise levels can reach over 130 decibels, which is louder than your average Christian metal concert. On top of that, you have to deal with cosmic radiation and temperature fluctuations that can cause bit flips in memory. Even on the surface of Earth, all computers will have bits flipped by this phenomenon over time. If you had a four gigabyte chip of memory, there's a 96% chance of having a bit flip over the span of 72 hours. While in the atmosphere of Earth, it is actually secondary particles resulting from the cosmic rays that cause this phenomenon. And it varies with altitude and location. This could be critical because if the byte that the flipped bit belongs to is being used to store important information like code or state, then the computer can potentially crash or produce unexpected results. For example, say we have four bytes of memory being used to store the current velocity of the rocket for the guidance algorithms, and a cosmic ray causes the most significant bit to flip. This value would increase by 2,147,483,648 and probably cause some strange results. On the other hand, a random bit being flipped could be totally inconsequential. That bit could be in a part of memory that's not currently in use or holds no data. And even if it is being used to store data, the change could have little effect. Going back to the last example, if a four byte number storing the velocity has the least significant bit flipped, the value would only change by one which might not be significant in some cases. There are a few ways to mitigate the risk of bit flips and cosmic radiation. The first is error correction code memory, usually referred to as ECC. This is a special type of memory that's able to detect and fix single bit errors. It's commonly used in servers or any other critical applications. The second is to use older process nodes. What I really mean is bigger, less complex transistors in any integrated circuits like processors and memory. Larger transistors are less susceptible to errors and as a result, these are usually older process node designs that have been available for some time and tested thoroughly. Sometimes bigger really is better. And finally, you can use radiation hardened processors. These are a special type of processor that's made specifically for environments where there's high levels of radiation. Commonly, these chips use silicon on insulator or silicon on sapphire, with other manufacturing changes to increase the resistance to negative effects caused by radiation. But SpaceX does not use radiation hardened processors in their rockets. Instead, they use regular commercial grade hardware, but they design the computer systems and the software to be radiation tolerant. This means they can detect and continue to operate properly when errors occur. And we're going to start with an overview of the computers on board the Falcon 9. Falcon 9 is a two-stage rocket, and after stage separation, the first stage has to navigate back to the landing site while the second stage boosts the payload into orbit. Because of this, both stages would need flight computers that can work independently of one another. Think of these main flight computers as the managers of each stage. 
sending commands to the various microcontrollers that are responsible for individual components like an engine or a grid fin. These commands are sent through a network of redundant ethernet and fiber optic cables which allow the various computers and controllers to synchronize their clocks as well. The software running on these computers and microcontrollers are operating on what they call the control cycle. This means the software is running in a loop that executes either at 10 hertz or 50 hertz, depending on the specific computer and its task. Every time this loop executes, the computer or microcontroller performs some type of work, like reading sensors or executing commands. The devices that need to respond more quickly will run the control cycle at 50 hertz instead of 10 hertz. To figure out how this works, let's first look at the main flight computers. The flight computer is a triple redundant system made up of three identical computers called flight strings. Each flight string has its own dual core x86 processor and memory, making the total core count six. x86 is a family of instruction set architectures first developed by Intel in the 70s and has been dominant in desktops, laptops, servers, and consoles since. Each core is running its own instance of the flight software using Linux as the operating system. During each control cycle, each core will read data and then send out a list of commands. The commands from the two cores within each flight string are compared, and if they are the same, the commands will be issued down the flight string. The three flight strings are sending commands independent of one another. The microcontrollers will compare the commands from each of the three flight strings to determine what should be executed. If one of the flight strings is sending bad commands because of an error, it can be shut down in flight and restarted. It will copy the memory from a good flight string and then it resumes execution of the flight software in sync with the other flight strings. This system provides a lot of redundancy against bit flips and other computer errors. For all of this to work, the control cycle I mentioned earlier is critical, and the strings need to all be synchronized. The main flight computer is running a 10 hertz control cycle, meaning every tenth of a second the cores will read available data, like state and sensor readings, and then compute the list of commands to send this cycle. Next, let's look at the operating system used by the computers and microcontrollers in more detail. Like I mentioned before, the main flight computers are using Linux. It's actually a version of the Linux kernel that's lightly modified by SpaceX to improve performance. I don't want to dig too deep into OS design, but I have started writing my own kernel and this stuff is really interesting to me. Normally Linux uses the completely fair scheduler, which holds a list of threads to execute in a red-black binary search tree and attempts to give all threads and processes a fair amount of time to run while keeping important threads responsive. Most computers running safety critical software will use a real-time operating system instead. A real-time operating system will ensure that threads can respond to events within well-defined time limits. For example, if you have software running an amusement park ride and it detects a malfunction, the engineers and developers would know the worst case delay for the software to respond and stop the ride. By default, Linux is not a hard real-time operating system, but it does have soft real-time capabilities like most mainstream OSs. But the problem with soft real-time is missing a deadline can happen frequently unlike with a hard real-time operating system which treats a missed deadline as a critical error. SpaceX patches Linux with RT underscore preempt, which improves the real-time performance of Linux. This patch, along with well-written code, can achieve the level of real-time performance they require while still getting to use an OS and an architecture that most developers out there have experience with. The microcontrollers don't have an operating system, but we'll talk more about that in a second because they are the next topic we are going to be digging into. The microcontrollers are using PowerPC processors and most are directly controlling a piece of hardware. They receive commands from all three of the flight strings and decide what should be executed. 
If all three strings are sending the same command, then it's pretty easy to determine that's the correct command to execute. But if one or two strings are sending different commands, it will decide based on what strings were correct previously. SpaceX regularly performs tests where they disable flight strings during simulated flights to make sure everything continues to work as expected. The Falcon 9 can still fly on a single flight string if it absolutely has to. Now let's get back to the software discussion. These microcontrollers are running either C or C++ code in a bare metal environment, meaning there's no operating system or even kernel to piggyback off from. From my experience, I would find it more likely that they write the code in C for the microcontrollers. This is because in a freestanding or bare metal environment, a lot of the benefits of using C++ are lost. There is no C++ standard library, a bunch of the language features don't work right out of the box, and a large amount of code is needed to get them to work, and it's a real pain in the ass to do all that. One more major system I want to mention is the AFSS, or the Autonomous Flight Safety System. It's a set of microcontrollers that constantly checks over the data to decide if the flight is still safe. It's separate from the main flight computer, and it has direct connections to the sensors it needs to read data from, as well as reading some additional data from the flight computer. This system is responsible for triggering an abort or the flight termination system if the flight becomes unsafe. Now next, we need to quickly talk about the elephant in the room. There's a reason why it's hard to find a lot of info on specifics when it comes to rocket hardware and software. And that's because of ITAR, or the International Traffic in Arms Regulations. It's a regulation set that covers everything associated with building and selling military or space-related equipment and services. This obviously includes rockets and satellites. These regulations are aimed at ensuring certain technologies and information doesn't get sold to countries like North Korea. In regard to rockets, the US doesn't want any company or individual giving Kim Jong-un or whoever the information or hardware to build ICBMs. These regulations impose a lot of restrictions on companies like SpaceX. For example, it limits what information they can publicly release and requires special exemptions to hire people from other countries. Because of this, there's just some things we can't know for sure, and I can only make educated guesses, especially when it comes to things like specifics about the hardware and algorithms they use. But enough with the government regulations. Let's talk about the benefits of SpaceX solution for the systems on board the Falcon 9. We've already established that the Falcon 9 uses commercial grade computer hardware and a non real time operating system. And that this solution created a few extra problems that SpaceX had to solve. Problems that a more traditional old space approach wouldn't have. But there's also a handful of key benefits that a more traditional approach wouldn't bring. Let's start with some of the benefits of using commercial grade hardware. First off, commercial grade computer hardware is readily available and super cheap. SpaceX can buy a bunch of extra hardware for the engineers and developers to use for hardware in the loop testing. This is where all of the computer hardware for a Falcon 9 rocket can be laid out on a table in the lab and software changes can be tested on the real hardware during a simulated flight. Developers can also perform hardware out of the loop testing on their own desktop computers since they use a similar architecture to the commercial hardware on board the Falcon 9, this is pretty simple. Third, finding employees who have experience with commercial grade computer hardware is pretty easy. Right now, in 2021, there's a worldwide semiconductor shortage affecting every sector, including spaceflight. So the supply of hardened processors has pretty much dried up. Even NASA is having to delay projects because they can't get a hold of enough hardened processors. The commercial market is still being affected by the shortage, but SpaceX would be in a much worse position if they used more specialized hardware for Falcon 9. The other interesting decision made by SpaceX is to use Linux for the main flight computers instead of a real-time operating system like Lynx OS or VRTX. But there's a few obvious benefits to using Linux. First, the majority of software developers are already deeply familiar with Linux which means a bigger potential pool of candidates and less on-the-job training. 
Also, Linux is an open source operating system, so the software team can trace issues and modify the kernel to get the exact behavior required. There's also a worldwide network of developers constantly improving and fixing bugs in the Linux kernel. And finally, there's a huge number of high quality open source libraries and tools already available for Linux. Elon Musk comes from a software development background, so it's not surprising that SpaceX would use hardware, software, and tools that are most commonly used in that industry. So after looking at the hardware and software being used by the Falcon 9, it might be surprising to find out that it's not some special military grade supercomputer. Instead, it has more in common with the devices you might find at home. For example, Android phones and a lot of smart devices use the same operating system kernel as the main flight computer. And most consumer desktops and laptops use the same instruction set architecture. And when it comes to computing power, the main flight computer is less powerful than the average modern desktop or laptop computer because it uses processors that are a handful of generations old. So really, you don't need a supercomputer to launch a payload into orbit and even have the booster come back and land. Instead, you only need regular computer hardware engineered to be as reliable as possible running very clever software. I hope this video answered any questions you might have had about the hardware and software SpaceX are using for the Falcon 9. If you enjoyed this content and want to see more from me, please subscribe and hit the bell to be notified when I upload. Programming and building computers are two of my biggest hobbies, so this video was a ton of fun to make. I hope you enjoyed it as well. That's it for me. I hope I see you guys soon. Stay safe. Peace. Benefits of SpaceX's solution. I'm just trying to say. Babe, what? can I have a drink? <laughs>